So as Massimo said, there's an awful lot of projects going on in VMware around cloud native apps and containers and that kind of thing. I'm not going to dive deep into all of them, but as I said, what I'm going to do is put myself in the position as hopefully what most of you guys are, a vSphere. So the first thing I have, we have developers who want to use containers. And so as a vSphere administrator, you can give them VMs on vSphere and they can run containers in VMs. But here's the first problem. They want to do persistence. So the thing with containers is, as Massimo said there, ephemerally you start them up, you do something, and you throw them away, and there's nothing persisted. So that brings us to the first project that we have going on. As I said, Docker's tell us that containers are stateless, so what are your options as a vSphere administrator? So this is where, again, this is just from DockerCon 16, stateless applications. So we've developed a Docker volume driver for vSphere, and this will allow you to create essentially VMDKs that are associated directly with containers. So not associated with the VM, but directly associated with the container. And that just means that anything that you do inside in that container from a data persistence perspective is persisted to that VMDK. So there's a few components that you do need to install. There's a component that goes on the ESXi host, and there's a component that needs to be installed in the VM itself. But once you have those two components installed, you can definitely do persistent storage for containers. And the one thing I do want to point out is that we are, all of the stuff that I'm talking about is essentially open source. So one of the things that we're trying to do at VMware is you know, embrace this open source initiative. So where applicable, I will put the GitHub location on where you can actually find the source and if you wish, contribute to these projects. So I have some animations here. Let's just start off with our basic virtual machine running on an ESXi host that has a VMDK. The first thing I'm going to do is install a VIB for the Docker volume driver on the ESXi host. There's an RPM that we install on Linux VMs. And from that point then, we can run standard Docker commands with specifying our Docker volume driver. In this case, it's called VMDK. So once we have that, you can see we've instantiated a VMDK on that volume. And then when I run a container image, I can select that VMDK as well. So that just means now that that container has persistence. So this is just some of the CLI that we would run through. There's the Docker volume create command in full. We've created a volume called myvol. We can list it. And now I can start a container image. In this case, it's Ubuntu. I'm going to drop into a bash shell, and I'm going to use that volume. So here I am in the bash shell. If I just list what's inside there, you can see that there's the volume that we just created. And even if I delete this Ubuntu container, I now have that VMDK persisted. It doesn't get deleted with the container, so I can reuse whatever data I've put in that container going forward. I could even start a completely different container image, like I could start at the, at the buy-in or whatever uh, Linux image uh, in the container, and I could reuse the same volume. The data is persisted. So the same thing now is true for vSAN. We can use these, uh, these uh, volumes on vSAN as well, if you so wish. So with vSAN, it's all policy-driven storage, so we have a CLI command to create a policy. And then through the Docker volume commands, I can again use the Docker volume driver, but I can specify the policy that I wish to use with that particular volume. And so once the volume is created, I can do my Docker run, run that image once more, and consume that volume. So as I said, it'll work on VMFS, NFS. It'll also work on vSAN. And the great thing about vSAN, of course, is that it's highly available storage. So if I do lose one of my hosts, in this case, it's a three-node cluster, I still have my two hosts available to provide a quorum, provide a copy of the data. My volume stays persisted. OK? And this is just running through the CLI once more, just showing you here this is the policy. It's just the command is wrapped around onto a few lines. But I'm just building a policy. Policy is created. If I list the policies right now, there aren't any volumes using that policy. So now I can go ahead and do the Docker volume create as before. There's the volume created. I can run my image using that volume. 
I've dropped once again into the Ubuntu Bash shell. If I just do a DF and I grip for the volume, there it is. But now if I drop back out to the ESXi host and I have a look at the volume or the policies, you can see that the policy is now in use by one volume. Now, all of this CLI-driven stuff, it's a bit horrible. I realize that, but we do have projects ongoing that will embed all of this into the HTML5 client, and also we're looking at doing a vCenter plugin so that you can do the whole thing from the UI. But right now it is, if you want to get started with this, straight away it is all CLI driven. And this is available right now, you can go and download it, you can go and play with it, and uh, we'd love to hear feedback about it if, you're, if you do need to use something like this that does do persistence of storage for containers. Great, so my, contain my, uh, my developers are sort of happy. I've been able to give them this persistent storage, but, and there's always a but with developers. They're pushing and pulling these images out to some external Docker hub or repository, okay? This means it's slow, because they're pushing it outside to the internet somewhere. It's also insecure. Who knows who else might be retrieving those images? And how do you protect them? You're a vSphere admin. How do you protect those? How do you make them highly available? And probably the most important thing, my company's intellectual property is going outside of my data center because they're doing these Docker push and pulls or whatever. They want you to fix it, obviously, because you're the vSphere administrator. So what are your options? So this introduces a project called Project Harbor, and I'll quickly go through that. It's essentially bringing a registry or a hub that you can run inside in your own data center for container images. So there's a lot of advantages in this. You know, it's, you can control over who can push and pull to it. It means your intellectual property stays inside in your data center. The other thing as well is you can set up replication between these, um, these harbor registries to make them highly available as well. And again, this is all open source. You can go up, download it. You can contribute to it as well. So this is typically what we see when we're talking about uh, pushing and pull to a Docker hub or a Docker registry, and that Docker registry lives somewhere out on some cloud or whatever the case may be. What we want to do is something like this. Now, I've shown here vSAN using Docker volume driver running on Photon OS, which is our operating system for I suppose, uh, containers and so on, if you want to look at it like that. But you can certainly do this on top of VMFS, on NFS. You don't have to use Photon OS. You can use uh, some other images if you wish. The point is, what we're doing is we're creating a couple of persistent volumes which allow us to store the registry, or to store containers in the registry locally. So that's essentially what Harbor is in a nutshell, bringing that registry, bringing that um, hub for con container images inside your data center and giving you the vSphere administrator control over this once more. Now we have another problem. So our developers now, they're happy, they've got persistent storage. We have Harbor set up, so you know, they're, they're able to push and pull very quickly and you have control over it. But I have no idea what the hell they're doing inside in these containers, okay? This is our big problem. So, what kind of things? Compute resources, how much compute are they consuming? How much storage are they going to consume? Uh, what networks are these containers communicating on? What ports are opened? All of these things, they're like a black box. No visibility into what's going on in these containers. So how can you manage containers in production, day two type operations? And this is now building also on what Massimo said earlier. So all of these day two operations, how to monitor what's going on, how to manage them, how can I back them up and restore them, and then from a security and auditing perspective as well. vSphere admin, how are you going to fix this? Okay, so this is vSphere integrated containers once more. So this is where the developers and the operations guys get pretty much an identical view of what's going on from a container's perspective. So as I said, Vic or vSphere inter integrated containers is not containers running in VMs, but it's containers running as VMs, okay? The great thing is that Vic is going to be available in vSphere 6.5, which we should be launching 
imminently. Is that okay? <laughs> Just to, yeah. But we did announce it at VMworld, so I think I'm okay to talk about it. Again, Vic, you can contribute to this. It's up on GitHub as well. So if you, if you like what Vic does, but you'd like to see some additional features added to it, you can definitely contribute. Okay, so let's talk about Vic. I mentioned what it was. We're going away from, well, we're not going away from, but what Vic is doing for us is it's not containers running in a VM, but it's a container running as a VM, and that's what that graphic is trying to show. And it gives the developers and the operators the same level of abstraction. So let's talk about it. So you have your vSphere environment, you have your vSphere infrastructure. How are you going to deploy Vic? Essentially what you do is you build this resource pool, and this re resource pool has what's called a virtual container host deployed in it. The virtual container host gives you a Docker endpoint, and that Docker endpoint you can give to your developers or your set of developers to start doing containers. As far as the developers are concerned, this is Docker. It looks like Docker, it smells like Docker, it feels like Docker, but it, there's no Docker in this. This is all done in vSphere. And so as they start doing their Docker run or Docker whatever commands that they're doing, they're building out these containers, but these containers are actually virtual machines. And you can have multiple groups of developers working in the same vSphere environment. All you have to do is build another resource pool with another VCH and another Docker API. And these set of developers can now start building out their containers as well. So what does it look like? You just get a, uh, a binary to deploy it. It's, uh, this one has just been deployed on a Linux virtual machine. So you could also deploy it from Windows. You could also deploy it from a Mac, I think, as well. And you just have to give it a bunch of commands, like what's the resource pool, what network is it going to run on, where will I store the images, all of those kind of things. And so what it does then is it deploys out this VCH or this resource pool, and you can see that it's doing a bunch of vSphere checks here. Continuing on to the next slide, you can see it's starting to deploy out this VCH, and at the end of the day, what you get is this Docker API endpoint. And you just give this to your developers, and they can start creating containers. So for instance, if I give this endpoint to a developer, they can start just running, in this case, they're doing Ubuntu image once more, dropping into the Bash shell. As I said, from a developer's perspective, it just looks and feels and smells like Docker. But the great thing is, from a vSphere administrator's perspective, yeah, this is what it looks like. So you get the container ID, you can see the funky names that we give, or that Docker gives containers there, but, we can see it in the resource pool, and we know that those developers are limited to that resource pool. We can see things like the network, we can see things like the CPU usage, all of that stuff which typically has been a black box and we had no visibility into, we now have full visibility as a vSphere admin into what these developers are doing. So that's the really nice thing about integrated containers, vSphere integrated containers. And we have a hacker lab on that as well. Okay, now back to my troublesome developers. So these guys are doing their Vic stuff, but again, we have another problem from them. They want some sort of orchestration. Okay, they, want, they don't want to be doing Docker run or whatever the case may be every time. They want some kind of orchestration with Vic. And they also would like to use you know, a local repository like Harbor. So what are your options as a vSphere admin? The orchestration, we have released a product called Admiral. Now, we will say this is in its infancy. But it comes as, once again, as a container. You can see it being deployed here. What it does is it gives you a, a web interface. And from here, then, you can connect to your Vic deployment, and you can you know, start orchestration, the, orchestrating the deployment of containers. Not only that. As I said, it, 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 in its infancy, there's a lot of work that we still need to do with Admiral. I'll just give you a heads up on it. But we can also integrate with Harbor as well. So we can have the orchestration provided by Admiral. We could have the repository uh, or hub provided by um, Harbor. 
And all of these will work with vSphere integrated containers as well. So for instance, through the managed registry, you can connect to different harbor instances if you so wish. And here you can see these are from a harbor deployment, these templates of containers, but this one is connected to Docker Hub. So you could have it either way or both ways if you wish. Okay, so just make a quick note of the time. Yeah, we're good. Okay, next problem. So great, my developers are now running with uh, Vic. Now I'm happy because I can see what they're doing, but I've given them the Harbor repository as well. Everything is kind of quick. I have control over it as well. I know that my company's IP isn't leaving the data center. And I have Admiral as well for doing a little bit of orchestration. And again, there's a but. I'd like to be able to give these guys highly available policy-driven persistent storage. So what are my options? So when I think of highly available policy-driven persistent storage in a VMware con context, what storage am I thinking of? VSAN, of course I am, yeah. <laughs> So there we go. So the point is that we can also have not just a virtual container host that's responsible for providing that Docker API endpoint. I, I can consume that. Uh, I can consume vSAN for that VCH as well. In other words, I can set a policy for it and make it highly available and make it distributed, whatever the case may be. But I can also do it for my containers. So once a container has been deployed as a VM, in the case of Vic, I can associate a policy with it to make it highly available on vSAN as well. So I could do lots of cool things, and Duncan is gonna talk about vSAN shortly, and what we've done in some of the later releases. But for instance, I could have a RAID 5 or a RAID 6 type configuration for my VCH or for my containers, or whatever the case may be. Okay, on to my next problem. So the developers are really getting into all this container stuff, and they quite like it. And now they've asked me, can I deploy Kubernetes? And my first response is, what? What are you talking about? I have no idea. So a quick Google later, and this is what I find out Kubernetes is. So it's basically a platform for container orchestration and that kind of stuff. So I've spent all this time now with uh, Vic and Admiral and Harbor and getting them set up, and now they want to do something like Kubernetes. So, hmm. Sounds complicated. How am I gonna set this up on my vSphere environment? Okay, what are my options? So fortunately, with the Kubernetes 1.4.5 release that just came out last month, there's full integration with vSphere as well. And what that means is I can natively deploy Kubernetes, that container orchestration framework or whatever clustering framework on top of vSphere using native Kubernetes uh, processes, procedures. Uh, typically, they're called cube up and cube down for starting up. So what that gives me is um, I just need to download the Kubernetes 145 image. VMware is providing you with an image as well, a VMDK image. Once you have both of those available, you just point Kubernetes at your vSphere infrastructure through a few environment variables and you can bring it up. So what it does is it auto-deploys, I think it's four or five different virtual machines. Inside in those four or five virtual machines, you will get the whole Kubernetes uh, infrastructure required for running uh, Kubernetes. So this is, I don't know if you can read it very well, but this is just a script. Now how I did it in my environment is I just used Photon OS, that OS from VMware, the new OS from VMware, in my guest set up the bunch of variables, downloaded what I needed, pointed it at my vSphere infrastructure, and what it does is it rolls out uh, one master and four minions, I think it calls it, yeah. So you get these five VMs deployed, and then you can just hand off this Kubernetes endpoint to your developers. Very neat, very simple. So if you do have developers who are, and uh, Massimo might be able to back me up on this, but Kubernetes seems to be that one cluster framework that is getting most momentum, I think. Um, so your developers who are working on containers possibly, this might be the, uh, the framework that they'd like to work with 
And I think that just the point I want to make is that you can very quickly stand this up on vSphere. Okay, uh, great. So now I have lots of different projects, right? I have the guys on Vic, I have a couple of guys on Kubernetes now as well. And as I said, someone Kubernetes is a way to develop their apps. Now other guys have heard of this stuff called Mesos and Mesosphere and Marathon. Pivotal Cloud Foundry, never heard of it. Docker Swarm as well, another cluster framework. So all these different groups of developers who want to work on different things. And some of these projects, they're talking about scaling to hundreds or thousands of ESXi hosts, depending on whether the project is a success or not. Um, you know, maybe some of them are thinking they found the next Pokemon Go or something like that, right? So. What options can VMware give me? And so Massimo was a little bit rushed when he uh, was talking about this, so I'll try and take the few minutes that I have left to give you another overview of Photon Control or Photon Platform. Now we're kind of using the terms interchangeably, but if you can think of like ESXi, vCenter, vSphere, it's kind of that relationship. So the whole point of uh, plat uh, Photon Control or Photon Platform is there's no a vCenter essentially in here. There's no real vSphere at all. It's just using the ESXi hosts, okay? And there's a few different components. I won't go into them in much detail, but essentially what we're doing is we're deploying a photon controller on top of a group of ESXi hosts to manage the deployment of all these different orchestration and cluster frameworks in a multi-tenancy type approach on top of another bunch of ESXi hosts if that makes sense. So the point here is that Photon Platform is not providing any of the orchestration or clustering frameworks. It is just enabling you to deploy all of these orchestration frameworks on top of ESXi. And again, because there's no vCenter or ESX, because there's no vCenter or vSphere, potentially we could scale to huge numbers of ESXi hosts. So just a little bit on the architecture, what we do is we take a bunch of ESXi hosts to behave as the management infrastructure, and then the rest of the ESXi hosts are what, are, what, are what we call the cloud infrastructure. I'm not sure if the term is really good, but on top of these ESXi hosts that are part of the cloud infrastructure, that's where we deploy the Kubernetes and the Mesoses and uh, Docker swarms and so on. So the idea is that you could have multiple tenants and you could have different groups of developers working in the different, uh, the different tenants, as I said. And then they can deploy whatever cluster or orchestration framework they so wish. So that's a kind of high level pitch of what it is. Uh, so the, for those of you who have worked with vCloud Director, a lot of the kind of um, terminology used, I think you'll be familiar with, but it's the fact that you can have tenants. Now, Photon Controller Platform, you can drive it through a UI, you can drive it through a CLI, and you can drive it through an API. So what I'm showing you here is some of the CLI commands that you can use to set up the building blocks for Photon Platform. You typically start off with a tenant, which is the Photon tenant create. Within a tenant then you could have different resource tickets, which would be the CPU, the memory, the, the storage, all of that good stuff. Within a resource ticket, you would then create a project. Now the project could consume all of the resource ticket, or you could have multiple projects within a resource ticket. But once you have the project, then you can deploy whatever orchestration framework you so wish. So that could be Kubernetes, it could be Mesos, it could be Docker Swarm, it could be Pivotal Cloud Foundry. Now Pivotal Cloud Foundry was one of the first uh, supported I don't know how you do orchestration frameworks. Is that the best term? I'm not sure how you describe it, but that there was an announcement of that running on Photon uh, platform back in March of this year. More recently, at VMworld, just in Barcelona in October, we announced the ability for Kubernetes as a service to be deployed on Photon platform. So this is essentially where you could give over a resource ticket to your developers and they can roll out as many Kubernetes as they wish, as long as they don't uh, go over the resources that have been allocated. The Mesos and Swarm does actually work, but there's no, um, the focus right now is Pivotal Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. Now, while there are ways of getting Mesos and Swarm to work, they're not taking priority within the Photon platform team right now. 
So just to give you an overview of how it all works, the building blocks, essentially what you do is you take one or more ESXi hosts, uh, you deploy out a photon controller installer, and a photon controller installer installs the photon controller. So that if you had three nodes, you'd typically end up with three of these photon controllers, and that's your control framework. And what's running inside in those then are some containers that provide you with the, the UI, the CLI, and all that kind of stuff, the API. So once we have those, we can start rolling out on top of our cloud ESXi host. Again, remember, there's no vSphere or vCenter in this. So the cloud infrastructure could be, as I said, theoretically go to the hundreds or thousands of ESXi hosts. And then once we have those rolled out, we can get the developers to build the tenants, the resource tickets, the projects, and then finally roll out the orchestration frameworks. And of course, they're all container driven as well. And the great thing is you can just scale out as you need. So we now have, thank you. So we now have, as I said, there's a UI um, look as well. This is probably all going to change by the time we get to a GA of this product, but it's just to give you an overview of that from a, uh, an operator's perspective or an administrator's perspective. You have all these different views of the resources available, but as far as the developers are concerned, they don't see any of this. What the developers see is either Kubernetes or Mesos, and Maritain is just something to run to orchestrate Mesos. It could be Docker Swarm or whatever the case may be. You can hand these off to the developers and they can go bananas doing whatever developers do. Meanwhile, you can take care of the, uh, the, IT, the, the operational perspective of it. So as I said, the Kubernetes as a service, I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but it's basically um, within the Photon platform, you hand off the tenants and resources to a particular developer those developers then can start deploying their own Kubernetes just by a drop-down service, essentially. So you don't even need to take care of that for them. The developers can take care of that for themselves. Cool. And so I now have Photon Platform deployed. I have lots of ESXi hosts, but no vSphere. Some guys are doing Kubernetes. Some are doing Mesos. Some are doing PCF. Others are doing Docker Swarm. I need to provide highly available, policy-driven, persistent storage once more. But future-looking, what are my options here, do you think? Anyone hazard a guess? Yay, vSAN, of course it is, yeah. So what we do, now vSAN, for those of you who've used vSAN, vSAN is coupled directly into vCenter server. But there's no vCenter server here in Photon Platform, so how are we going to do that? So what we've done is we decoupled completely vSAN from vCenter server in order to provide highly available persistent storage for the containers and VMs that are running on Photon platform. So we have now a vSAN management VM and we have an authentication VM because we don't just want anybody setting up a vSAN cluster, blowing away a vSAN cluster, right? We want to be able to make sure that whoever's doing those vSAN commands actually are who they say they are. So there's two new VMs that we've introduced that can run on the management infrastructure for Photon Platform through a set of RVC commands. These are the Ruby vSphere console commands. We can set up vSAN, we can create policies, we can do all of the good stuff. We just can't do it through a UI. And that simply means that all of those, that cloud infrastructure that's running on Photon Platform can now consume vSAN storage as well. So the VMs that are making up those Kubernetes or Mesos or Docker Swarms would be highly available as well. So that's basically it. Um, that was to try and highlight to you a whole bunch of different uh, issues you might come across as a vSphere administrator when trying to provide uh, containers for your developers. From a persistent storage perspective, we have things like the Docker volume driver. It'll work with VMFS, with NFS, vSAN as well, vSphere integrated controllers, uh, vSphere integrated containers can also consume vSAN and policy driven storage. And then finally, I just talked about a little bit of future looking stuff with the Photon platform, Photon controller. And once again, there's projects underway to allow that particular product to consume vSAN as well. 
So I think I might have made good time on that. I'll just check. I know. Yeah, not so bad. Um, I'm going to be around all day. I'm going to be helping Massimo in the hacking labs. If there's any questions on anything that I presented here, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for your time.